Our petitions have been slighted. Our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult. Our supplications have been disregarded. Again, notice the use of the semicolon. Notice the use of these parenthetical phrases. But there's repetition and parallelism going on here. And we have been spurned with contempt from the foot of the throne, exclamation mark. Whoa! In other words, the argument here is, we have not been acting like courageous men anymore. We're acting like cowards, right? I'm on the fourth line, by the way, on page 434 down. That idea that we've been trying to get along and be friends and get along, and it's not worked. In vain, after these things, may we indulge the fond hope of peace and reconciliation. It is a fond hope because it's a happy idea, but it's an empty idea for Patrick Henry, we might say. There is no longer any room for hope. It may be the, piv the pivotal line in the, in the uh, beginning of this speech. There is no longer room for hope. And then, of course, here comes his real thesis. If we wish to be free, notice the repetition of the word if. If we wish to be free, if we mean to preserve inviolate those inestimable priv privileges for which we have been so long contending, if we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle to which we have been so long engaged, in which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest shall be obtained, dash, we must fight. Notice how this is set up. Rhetorically speaking, this is the if-then construction. Write that down. Notice it. If, he says, we wish to be free, if we wish to preserve our dream of an American freedom, then, if then, right? Notice the dash is the, is the use of the word then. It's supplements for it. Then, we must fight. And there's your thesis or your central idea. We will use these terms interchangeably in 303. There's your thesis. We must fight. We have no option left, right? Now again, notice, he's been speaking for probably 10 minutes. At the beginning of the speech, he began by saying, really respect what's been said. Really grateful. I think we got a serious problem. I don't think we got a little problem. I think we got a serious problem. Question, what's up with all the ships off our coast? If those guys are wanting to be friends and get along, how come the military build up? The only option now for us is fight. Notice how he didn't, notice, he didn't just step up and say, idiots who just spoke, fools who just spoke, let's fight. No, 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 no. Notice the genius of the language. He begins by saying, I respect what's been said, but I don't think it makes much sense. When you look at the experience of what's actually out there, in other words, let's look at the facts. The facts are, we got to fight. We must fight. I repeat it, sir, we must fight. An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that is left us, exclamation point. Whoa. So here already, let's put it in our notes. The courage of Patrick Henry to say, I respect what other important men have said already, but dude, now is the time. We got to fight. We don't have a choice. There comes a time when talk is no longer of value. You got to have to fight. You got to stop. You got to stop the aggression, right? Now notice the use of the interesting pronoun they. Next paragraph. By the way, let's just pause at number 13 just to see what your textbook has to say about organizational structures. Read it with me. Henry, the key word here is carefully builds his argument. First, he explains why he needs to speak freely and urges others not to deceive themselves. Next, he explains the motives of the British and then shows the ineffectiveness of the colonists' response. Only after carefully preparing listeners does he now speak directly of armed rebellion. Notice the use of the pronoun they. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. Now, who is the they? Well, the most famous line in American political thought is, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And, of course, the pronoun we requires the question in grammar study, what is the antecedent? Yes? In other words, who is the we we are talking about? Notice the same as they. Let's write it down. The antecedent, that which refers to the pronoun they, the antecedent for the pronoun they is actually two different groups. Obviously, when you ask, who tells us that we are we? Obviously, one answer is the English. 
The other answer is, of course, going to be the very guys who just got through talking. The reason why those guys say, no, 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 we cannot fight against these guys, is because, hello, England's the largest navy in the world. We do not have a standing army that can compete with these guys. That would be suicide politically for us, culturally for us, to try and fight against England. They, go back and look at it now, they tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be the next week or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed? By the way, this is the source of the right to bear arms as being so integral and important a part of our Constitution. The idea is if we ever give up that right of bearing arms, we make ourselves so weak we can't protect ourselves. Now, obviously today, this debate about how the Constitution gives us the right to bear arms becomes a whole different kind of debate. But I want you to appreciate the original reason why it was even considered in the first place. We have to protect ourselves. We cannot give up that right. We, I mean, we don't have a choice. Keep reading. And when a British guard shall be stationed, in, uh, will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength? by irresolution and inaction? Notice all of these rhetorical questions. Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope until our enemies shall have bound us hand and foot? Now, of course, this is compelling writing, isn't it? Notice the repetition of the word shall over and over again. We wouldn't say shall today, we would just say will. In other words, am I going to lie here and just take this? The great Martin Luther King Jr., in his famous speech, uh, his famous essay, essay where it opens with, oppressed people respond to oppression in three characteristic ways. In that first of those three ways, he calls it acquiescence. And he harks back to this very speech. In other words, you can't just allow them to put their navy out there, walk into our towns, take away all of our firearms, and then subjugate us. Can't allow it. If we do that... We basically have lost any chance of liberty, freedom, hope, right? Sir, and now he says it, we are not weak if we make a proper use of those means which the God of nature hath placed in our power. Three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess are invincible by any force which our enemy shall send against us. Whoa, look at the word invincible. You want to write that one down? In other words, he says it. I can do the math. Three million people is nowhere near, obviously, the standing army that England with their navy can bring. But three million people who are armed and dedicated to a cause, that is to say, believers, believing in a cause, those people they're, we'll be invincible. This is a subtle way to say it. Put it in your notes. Patrick Henry is arguing, God is on our side. It's a very interesting argument, right? Invincible by any force. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. Whoa, this is an interesting argument. In other words, the argument is, God's taking care of us. Again, we're back to that notion. But he also says, Henry, that God will help us find allies. Of course, we immediately think of the French, don't we? Right? The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, that, the, the, the steadfast, the active, the brave. Note your trinities. Note your threes. Of course, in your junior year, when we study our Lincoln, right, and we take a look, for example, at that famous Gettysburg Address, even if you don't know the whole thing, you know, maybe know the opening lines four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Of course, Lincoln is hearkening back to the four score and seven years ago to this speech. This is the speech of American roots. And yet, do you remember how that Gettysburg Address ends? A government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. Loves his threes, loves his trinities. This, and many, many argue, comes from our uh, appreciation of St. Augustine in the Augustinian tradition. Francis Bacon, of course, loved his threes as well. Notice we have the threes here. Play it again. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It's to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Right? Besides, sir, we have no election. And by election here, 
We mean choice. Put that in your notes. The word election here doesn't mean to vote. It means we have no choice. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat, but in submission and slavery, exclamation point. Wow. Now, let's point out why this is important in the American tradition. Because many years later, I already mentioned him once, I'll come back to him. Martin Luther King Jr., the great civil rights movement leader, and those who are with him, look at a speech like this and look at that line. We don't have but two choices. We either submit and become slaves, or we stand up and we fight. Now, of course, the fighting in the civil rights movement will be nonviolent resistance. Why? Because King said, violence never in the end ultimately works. It may work for a while, but ultimately it doesn't work. An eye for an eye leaves everyone blind, as he quotes in that famous essay. And yet I want to point out the tradition here that's in a profoundly American tradition, and here is why you should be patriotic to your country. Because this is a country that prides itself on the notion of standing up. You stand up. You fight for what is right. And here he's saying it. The war is inevitable. Let it come. I repeat it, sir. Let it come. Notice all of the exclamation marks, right? He finishes now his speech. Whoa, let's just point out. There's more than a few thinkers in the house that are doing one of these numbers like this with their head. Dude, are you serious? No way. We cannot. This is insane. We cannot do this. And so he's got to find a way now that he has said what he needs to say to finish his essay. Remember, good essays, three parts, beginning, middle, end. So let's play the game now of the end and see how he finishes this up. By the way, did you notice the figurative language at number 14? At the climax of his speech, Henry repeats a vivid metaphor. The British are putting the Americans in chains to drive home his point and to accomplish his purpose, persuading the colonists to revolt. Let's finish now. It is in vain. By the way, you notice this word vain? That's not the thing that's in your arm, vain. That's a different word, okay? Vain, that's that's thing that carries blood. It's a different spelling. This vain here means useless, okay? So write that down. Vain here. We don't use that word very much today unless we're talking about somebody being conceited. You are so vain, meaning you're so conceited. Here, the word vain simply means kind of impossible, silly. So read it as that. It is in vain, silly, sir, to extenuate the matter. Extenuate here meaning to treat as less serious, to pretend like it is not actually an, an issue. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. He's, he's quoting here from a biblical text. The war is actually begun, exclamation point. The next gale, wind, that sweeps from the north. And again, we are in, uh, read your footnote, in Massachusetts, right? North of Virginia, some colonists had already shown open resistance to the British in this regards. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Notice all the exclamation points in this. Our brethren are, ready, are, 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 are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? If, is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. Again, what Martin Luther King Jr. will call acquiescence. Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take. But as for me, maybe the most famous lines in American thought, give me liberty or give me death, exclamation point. Many studiers uh, and historians of this passage will point out the importance and the use of that exclamation point. Now, let's make a point, obser an observation in our own writing. We don't want to overuse the exclamation point, but it is clear that this is used in this speech for a reason. By the way, let's point this out. Before this speech was ever read, it was heard. And so the exclamation points are, of course, for Patrick Henry, the one giving the speech. That is to say, when he sees those exclamation points, he's reminded in his own tone of voice, and I've tried to capture a little bit of that obviously in my own reading of this, that in his own tone of voice, he wants to somehow share the enthusiasm, the courage, the conviction that he has. All right, well, let's finish obviously up to a let's talk major message here. Well, it's clear, isn't it? I mean, you have to, you have to be somewhere else mentally to not appreciate exactly what it is he's saying. We do not have a choice. The time is on us. Let's fight. We gotta do it.
right? At 2B, well, this is a brilliant example of what good rhetoric looks like, what it sounds like, yes? Notice all of the repetitions. Notice the genius construction. He doesn't just jump up and say, those guys who talk before are all fools and idiots. We got to go to fight. No, 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 no. He begins very respectful. He begins conscious of the fact that a number of the people who are going to listen to him and then later read this speech, obviously it was published for a reason, right, uh, are going to disagree with him. So he wants to show respect. Then he's going to give his position. And then finally, he's going to end by saying, you know what? I'm ready to die for this cause. You'll remember that it was the great civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr., who said, I'm very interested to know not what it is you're willing to live for, but what you're willing to die for. Do you have something that you believe in that strongly? Of course, King was talking to those important movement thinkers in the civil rights movement to say, do we believe in it strong enough to die for it? And of course, King himself is proof that he was willing to die for it. That is the American tradition. That is Patrick Henry's give me liberty or give me death. Let's jump to level three. At 3A, what is for you your favorite speech that basically says we have to fight? For many years, one of the most popular was the film Braveheart, Mel Gibson's film, which probably now is so old that many of you as freshmen haven't seen it. But there's a pivotal moment in that film where the William Wallace character played by Gibson has to give a speech. For those of you who are Lord of the Ring fans, the Pete Jackson uh, trilogy, you know all about that. Before it's time to fight, there has to be a speech that's given. Let's ask this question in the American tradition. Okay, so somebody gets elected. Okay, we got to inaugurate that somebody. But why the speech? Ball players in the house. Okay, we got to go out and play a ball game. Okay, but why before we play the ball game, a speech in the locker room. What is up with the American fascination with speech giving? Well, it goes back to a speech like this. In other words, before we do something, we like to give a reason for it. And of course, in America, it is a country built on great rhetoricians, on great speakers. In fact, those greatest of thinkers were raised to learn to give powerful speeches. And we'll study a number of speeches in your high school career. We'll, in our freshman year, take a look at the I Have a Dream speech. We'll take a look at several other speeches as well. Nelson Mandela's famous speech at the conclusion, at, uh, when he was being inaugurated. We'll look at a lot of speeches, right? In the history of America, you could do a lot by simply asking this question at, three, at 3B. What is the most important speech in your life? What's the moment in your life when somebody, might have been a teacher, might have been a parent, might have been a coach, might have been a politician, might have been somebody you were reading, but the speech moved you in some way. It made you stand up and say, no, I am going to do this. I am going to do this. That is the American tradition to be moved by language, to allow language to challenge the way we think and to move us. And finally, of course, the, the question of all questions. You now live in a much different time than when this speech was given. Yes? To what degree does America still appreciate and understand its roots in liberty? And the ways in which, again, those two texts we've studied, learned hands observation about what it means to be an American and to love and, to love and respect liberty and freedom. And then, of course, a speech like this. The challenge, I hope, is one for you. Of course, the ultimate challenge is both Learned Hand and Patrick Henry remind you, those are your roots. I hope, as Americans, you can appreciate that. Thank you.